Today, we'll talk about some of the tools GitLab provides as part of the software development lifecycle to help you get from idea to production as quickly as possible. We'll start with a brand new GitLab installation and walk you through chat ops, issues, planning boards, merge requests, CI, CD, and more. The first step is to install GitLab. We provide a Docker image, which makes deploying GitLab a breeze. Today, we'll make use of Red Hat's OpenShift with Kubernetes. We'll create a new project, making sure to give it a unique name. You can optionally provide a display name or description to help you organize your OpenShift projects. We can search for the GitLab template and configure it. Once we click on Create, we can go to the Overview page. Here, we can watch the image deploy. You will see GitLab, Postgres, and Redis be set up. Once deployed, we can scale the instance up or down as needed. Here we can create a new user. Once we're logged in, we can begin to create projects. When creating a new project, we have the option to create a brand new blank project or import one from another location. We can also set the visibility level. In this case, we'll set our project to be public. Just like that, our project is created. Now we'll tab over to our chat app, in this case Slack, and we can see that a new Slack channel has been created for our project. We can use this channel to help us manage aspects of our project. Say someone has a great idea for the project and they mention it on Slack. You can create an issue via the chat client and it will appear under the project's issue list in GitLab. You can see the GitLab Slack integration has created the issue and provided us with the link. If we click it, we can see more information and interact with the newly created issue. If we wanted to work on this issue right away, we could assign it to ourselves or prioritize it with the issue board. Since this is a new project, we might want to add a few new columns to our issue board to match our workflow. We'll add a to do and a doing column to help us get started. Now we can drag our issue from the backlog into the to do column to indicate that it should be worked on in this sprint. If we decide we want to work on it, we can drag it to the doing column, click on it, and assign it to ourselves to let the team know that we're working on it. Let's get coding. If we go back to the project, we can see that no code has been added to it just yet. However, there are some suggestions to help us get started. We're taken to an editor where we can start writing. After adding some information about our project, we can commit our changes. We can now see our newly created readme file. Editing one file at a time can be great for small changes like this, but what about editing multiple files? Let's open up coding to help us with this. If you're not familiar with coding, it's a browser-based development environment. Now that we're encoding, we can see a list of files in our project as well as a terminal prompt. This terminal allows us to run command line utilities for our project, such as asset compilation or database migrations. Since we just created this project, we don't have any code yet. However, we'll use a boilerplate app to help us get started. Once we've copied it over, we can commit it to our project. Our original idea here was to create a new logo, so we can just copy our new logo over to our project. If this were a more complex problem, we could click Start Collaboration, share the link, and begin a pair programming session. Coding allows us to do more than just edit files and move images around. We can also run commands like we would on our local machine or server. Let's go ahead and install the dependencies of our app. Now we can start our app. We're using Node.js, but you can use a variety of languages and frameworks. Our site is now running on localhost according to coding, but we'll need to visit the IP address of our machine to view it in our browser. Now we can see our web page, complete with our beautiful logo. Everything looks good, so let's go back and check in our changes. We'll make a new branch for these changes so that we're not committing them to master. We can then add our commit message and push the changes to our server. Now we can switch back to GitLab to see that it's detected a new branch. We also get an option to create a new merge request based off of the changes that we just pushed. Let's go ahead and do that. GitLab has automatically detected that this commit closes the issue that we created earlier and has auto-filled the title for us. Looks good, so let's go ahead and save this. Let's go back to our merge request. Now we can see that creating this merge request has kicked off some builds for us. This CI pipeline was copied from the Kubernetes template we used. Let's dig a little deeper. We can see that our build is finished, but we can view the log of what happened. This is useful if your build fails as it allows you to see errors. Here we're building a Docker image of our app. Then we run some tests. You could put anything in these stubs as you're not limited to these steps. 
We then release our Docker image to the container registry with the final image. Here's an overview of our pipelines. This is the one we just looked at, but you can see here that when we pushed a master, the app was sent to our staging server as well. If we take a look at the container registry, we can see a few images that were generated from this pipeline, including this latest image that was generated from our push to the master branch. Let's go back to our merge request. We could ask another developer on the team to review this, and they could look at the change set and leave comments. They could comment on the code changes inline or leave comments on the merge request itself. Anyone involved or watching this merge request would be notified of any changes or comments made, but what if we wanted to see the code running? We can see that this app has been deployed to a review app as part of our pipeline. We can click that link to view the app in our server. Here we can see our change running live so that we can see the code we're reviewing in action. This is great for developers collaborating on a project, but also product managers, QA people, or others who may not want to look at the code but who want to see changes. Since we're happy with this change, let's go ahead and merge it into master. Once we do, we can see that it kicks off another pipeline run on the master branch. We can follow along as the jobs process. We can watch the build stage just in case any breaking changes were made that were not caught previously. This stage makes sure that the code still builds after the merge. We can watch the log of this if we want to see what actions are being performed. While we wait, we can take a look at our OpenShift web console. Here we can see that it's auto-scaled our GitLab runner up so that we can run jobs in parallel. You can see that once OpenShift scales up runners, the jobs complete faster. The tests have finished, and now it's auto-deploying to our master branch. If we look at the log, we can see it's pulled down the Docker image and pushed it out to our server. It's also used Kubernetes to update the image tag. If we look at our environments, we can see that our staging environment was updated less than a minute ago from our master branch. If we go back to merge requests, our open one is now closed. We can find it under the merge tab. If we take a look at it now, we see that the review app is gone but has been replaced with staging. If we click on our staging app, we can see our site on our staging environment with the logo we added. Since these changes look good, let's go ahead and ship them to production. If we go back to our pipelines, we can see there's a manual action for deploy to production. We could click that to kick off a production deployment, but let's use chat ops instead. We can go back to our chat channel and use the deploy command to deploy staging to production. The integration has kicked off a deployment to staging. If we go back to our pipelines in GitLab, we can follow along while staging is deployed to production. Had we clicked the deploy button in the interface, it would have triggered the same procedure. These are called manual actions and are configurable in the GitLab CI YAML file. While we wait, let's go back to our environments page. We can see some more details about our staging environment, such as the deploys we did previously. This is great for debugging production incidents where something has degraded or changed and you're not exactly sure why. You could use this to figure out which deploy caused it. In the event that that happens, you can even roll back deployments here. This lets you go back to the last known good version. If we go back to environments, we can see that now our production environment server shows up, and we can see that it was deployed less than a minute ago with our latest changes. Now we can take a look at our production site and see that it has our latest changes with our new logo. We went all the way from idea to production. Since the cycle of idea to production is critical, GitLab has built in a dashboard to help you track it. If you click on the Cycle Analytics tab, you can see some metrics on the overall health of the project with a breakdown of average time spent on each stage on the way from idea to production. This is great for team managers and high-level managers looking to understand their company's release cycle time, which is key to staying competitive and responding to customers. It even includes stats for the last few features that made it into production, and you can drill down into each stage to see the, how those features looked. We're extremely excited to roll out these features for you, and we look forward to helping you get from idea to production faster.